I would like to welcome you to the first annual Women of Excellence Celebration. As you are aware, March is Women's Month. We have a wonderful and enlightening program for you all today. As we celebrate women of our past, present, and future. Our hope is that the PowerPoint presentation and today's speaker, words of wisdom spoken from the hearts, inspire all of us to excellence. In doing this, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to Bainbridge College family, community, and students our guest speaker, Dr. Mary Diallo. Dr. Diallo is a leader in the surrounding community. She was the first African-American woman student from Athens, Georgia, to attend the University of Georgia. Dr. Diallo is an associate professor of French in the College of Arts and Science in Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida. She served as the president of the faculty senate and a member of the search committee for the university president. Now following Dr. DLO's presentation, there will be an opportunity for you all to ask Dr. DLO a question. So without further ado, Bainbridge College, please help me in welcoming Dr. Mary Diallo. Thank you very much. To the Bainbridge College administration, student, faculty, staff, and guests, I'm honored to stand before you today and I thank you for this precious recognition. When somebody my age speaks to young people, there is sometimes a fear of not being able to bridge the so-called uh, generation gap. So let me share something that may give students some insights about those of us who were born before 1945, and I'm one of them. And I found this tidbit on, on the internet, and it is said for all those born before 1945, we were born before television, penicillin, polio shots, frozen foods, Xerox, contact lenses, and frisbees. We were born before radar, credit cards, split atoms, laser beams, and ballpoint pens. We were born before dishwashers, clothes dryers, electric blankets, air conditioners, drip dry clothes, and before man walked on the moon. We were born before daycare centers, group therapy, and nursing homes. We never heard of FM radio, tape decks, electric typewriters, and I bet some of you have never heard of tape decks or used a typewriter. We never heard of artificial hearts, word processors, and yogurt. I went to France as a student in 1969, and I had never heard of yogurt. And in the French restaurant at the uh, university, we, they served yogurt every day. So my other American uh, friends and we kept saying we don't like this stuff what is it so finally one day I said to myself I tasted the yogurt I tried it at a couple of days and I said this is just buttermilk with sugar in it and from that point on I ate yogurt okay we never had pizzas McDonald's and instant coffee was unheard of look how far we have come in such a short time we are now experiencing with you, young people, the most amazing revolution in technology. Yes, many of us have computers, iPods, iPads, and tablets. We use Skype, Facebook, play words with friends. We also send text messages. Technology has helped my generation link to yours in many ways. I've been asked to speak about my experience at the University of Georgia. But before I do that, I'd like to speak briefly about some of the people and events that led to my entering UGA in the fall of 1962. In recounting my past, it would be simple <clears throat> to say I grew up in Athens, Georgia, where I attended elementary and high school, 
graduating valedictorian of my class in spite of coming from a very poor family and being the oldest of ten children. I earned a bachelor degree and a master's of arts degree uh, from the University of Georgia and a PhD from Emory University and I did all of my studies in French literature. But after reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, which many of you may have already read, I decided to revisit my journey in light of his theory about outliers. Gladwell says that outliers are those who have, given, who have been given opportunities and who have had the strength and presence of mind to seize them. In his book, he discusses such American icons as Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, but he also talks about lesser known people as well as his own mother, who is an outlier. After reading this book, I began to look back at my own career path in light of the opportunities that have come my way at the right time. And I want to emphasize the words, at the right time. I'm going to start with my mother and compare her life to mine. As a child going to school in a one-room schoolhouse, she was one of the brightest students in the school. But that was not enough, because although she wanted to go to high school, her grandparents were raising 12 other children and could not afford to send her to Athens, which was about 22 miles away from home, her hometown in Oglethorpe, in Oglethorpe County, Georgia. <clears throat> she later married and had 10 children. I heard that story and sensed the disappointment my mother must have experienced. Hearing that story as a child was probably my greatest motivation. You see, my mother was born at the wrong time for a poor African-American child in Oglethorpe County, Georgia. A time when a high school education was not only out of reach for her, but also her immediate family. Unlike today, there was no high school in her small county. She lived in the wrong county. I grew up determined to, quote, right the wrong, and to do the things I believed my mother would have done if she had had the opportunity to attend high school. Her plight and disappointment taught me how important an education is. Other than my mother, my father, who made me promise that I would graduate from high school, my aunts and uncles who always encouraged me and set good examples as they worked hard and were able to provide for their families and even buy homes. But teachers have had the most influence on the direction of my professional and personal life. And one of the best examples of that is my first grade teacher, Mrs. Nancy Nesbitt. It's interesting how you remember. I remember the people who were so important in my life. After all of these years, I still remember their names. Mrs. Nesbitt taught me two important lessons. First of all, she treated all the children in her class the same, regardless of their backgrounds. And in those days, you had the children of the ministers, the children of the teachers, and you had the children of the poor and educated all in the same classroom. What mattered to her was the work you did in her class, and I did my work. In the beginning, as a first grader, I made all A's for a few days. But one day, I didn't make 100. And I became so upset about the grade that I started to leave the classroom telling Mrs. Nesbitt that I was going home. <laughs> she caught me as I was walking out of the door, gave me a good spanking, something she would not have been able to do today. So my lesson was, I will not always make perfect scores, and that's okay. During that same year when I was in the first grade, my neighbor, Mrs. Weaver, was sitting on her porch and as I walked by one day, she asked to see my schoolwork. 
And when she saw that I had all hundreds, she gave me a nickel and told me to keep working hard. My mother was not thrilled at the idea because she thought that I had been begging. But this kind gesture, or what we would call today this random act of kindness, had a lasting impression on me. I truly believe that sometimes the smallest acts of kindness have the power to motivate a child. Learning became so important to me that when I was in the third grade, I was so upset when the teacher allowed a fourth grader to listen to me read because she was playing checkers with the fourth grade boys. I went home told my mother, who only had a seventh grade education, about this teacher who was not doing her work. My mother sat down, wrote a letter to the teacher, and told her that it was her job to teach me. I was very proud of her. The letter made the teacher angry, and it was clear that she didn't like me from that point on. But she never let another student listen to me read. The lesson I learned, there is a price for standing up for what is right. I had many wonderful teachers, and Dr. Walter Allen, who was my high school band director, I will speak more about him later, but I also had Victoria Stroud, my piano teacher, Howard Stroud, her husband, and my eighth grade English teacher. My piano teacher became what we would now call a mentor, but in those days she was my second mother, or my play mother. She taught me how to be a lady, she listened to me, she guided me, she taught me how to uh, dress when I was in high school. In the 60s, I started wearing an afro. She was furious. When she couldn't convince me to change my hairstyle, she said, oh well, maybe one day there will be, a, be some Afro wigs. We laughed about that and years later we said we would have been rich we, if we had followed through with that idea, okay? <laughs> I talked about Dr. Allen in the article that I wrote for the University of Georgia's uh, alumni magazine and I just want to briefly speak about him again. When I was in the eighth grade, I told him that I had always wanted to play the piano from the time I was six years old. Shortly after that, Dr. Allen arranged for me to take piano lessons and he paid for my lessons for one year. He also gave me albums of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. He gave me albums of Broadway shows like My Fair Lady, West Side Story, and he gave me jazz albums of Ella Fitzgerald, Errol Gardner, and others. I played them over and over again. And today I can still sing from the Ella Fitzgerald album. For example, got a little rhythm, a rhythm, a rhythm that puts the top to my brain. Or the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. I think she's got it, okay? Or West Side Story. I want to be in America, everything's free in America, okay? <laughs> <laughs> For a brief moment, I dreamed of being the next Ella Fitzgerald. But when Dr. Allen told me that musicians don't make a lot of money, I decided to become a teacher. But, did, but he didn't tell me that teachers don't make a lot of money either. <laughs> okay. That is why I'm even more appreciative now of the financial support he gave me. Once I saw a t-shirt that had this quote, those who can do, those who can do more, teach. Dr. Allen did more because he cared. He cared enough to assist four high school seniors to apply to the University of Georgia in 1961. He cared enough to make us believe that we had every right to attend UGA. I probably would not have attended UGA if he had not had the courage to support our efforts. And I must tell you, he was the only person in Athens, Georgia, who agreed to work with the four of us when we applied to the University of Georgia. Everybody else 
all of my teachers were afraid. And once I was accepted to Georgia, no one mentioned it. It was an open secret. When I graduated, it was not mentioned in our school newspaper. And when I graduated, the, the night of my graduation, there was no mention of it. So there was a rampant, I mean, fear was rampant in our little city. Unlike my mother, I was born at the right time and had the right teachers and mentors. It has been my lifelong goal to repay them and to make my mother proud by teaching others. Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes were the first African Americans to attend the University of Georgia. They opened the doors for me and countless others. Although Hunter and Holmes Although Hunter and Holmes <coughs> were the first to attend UGA, the first African American to graduate from UGA was Mary Frances Early, who earned a master's degree in music education in 1962. Carrie Russian, Alice Henderson, Harold Black, and I were the only African Americans in the freshman class of 1962. Since I was from Athens, I had a lot of support from my community. Social organizations and churches raised money for me. In 1963, the New Yorker magazine published an article by Calvin Trillin about the students at the University of Georgia. This article caused a chain of events that gave me more opportunities than I had ever dreamed possible. The article was read by an Englishman, Mr. John Blofeld, who lived in Thailand. He chose to write to me because he said that he believed I was the one in need of the most help. The article pointed out that my father was a taxi driver and that I...